to the Simple Steps Personal Finance Podcast, bringing personal finance to you step by step. This is episode two. Today we're going to talk about the foundations of your personal finance. Everyone looks for reference points in their life, and money is no different. How do you know whether you are on track? You judge your position against that of something relative. But what is that reference point? If you look at what others have, you'll get a false image. It's been reported this month, October 2014, by the money charity that the average person in the UK owes around £29,000, with average earnings of just under £25,000. That means the average person owes a year's worth of pre-tax salary and a bit more. Shocking, isn't it? Now this figure includes mortgages, so you could say it's inflated. But on the flip side, it's an average for everyone out there who has no debt. That amount is spread amongst those other people who do have debts. The average mortgage is estimated to be £116,000 less change. The average household credit card debt is 2180 Average consumer credit borrowing, so loans as well as credit cards, was £3,220 for every UK adult. Now, I'm not intending to swamp you in figures here, but there's a bigger message in amongst all this. Debt is normal. Being in debt has become normal. So next time you look over at that shiny white BMW next to you at the lights, it's an illusion. They borrowed to buy it. Next time the neighbours go on holiday to a warm island in the winter, don't get jealous, they'll still be paying it off next year. And that conservatory was funded by a second mortgage. They'll have false teeth before the last payment's made on that sucker. Why am I making such a fuss of this? Well, if you look at the guy next to you to see where you stand on the money ladder, you're likely to misjudge and fall off. Appearances rule in this world, but the real truth is murky and seedy. Being broke has become normal. That couple with great jobs, a sports car for him, a 4x4 for her, lovely manicured garden, two kids in private school, at best, they're spending all of their income to create the picture-perfect life. At worst, it's being funded by debt. In truth, it's likely a combination of both. They inefficiently spend their income, just reacting to the slurry of bills that appear each month, the credit card from the two holidays abroad, the personal loan payment from the house extension, the higher purchases for the cars... And when Christmas comes around or one of the kids' birthdays, something irregular and out of the blue, then that other credit card comes out. You know the one. The one with the air miles and the points on it. Yeah, that one. See? They're doing good things spending on that card. That's how you end up with every man, woman, teenager, pensioner and child in this country owing an average of £2,500 each. That's a lot of futures that have been sold for the here and now. If you look at the person next to you, you're comparing yourself to an illusion. What can you do then? Well, first off, don't look to compare yourself to a person. Compare your situation to a desirable situation instead. We all know what a good situation with money looks like. No debt for starters. Some savings in the bank. Money set aside and growing for retirement. Enough money each month to enjoy some of the nicer things in life. Have a nice home. Eat decent food. Have a nice car. Have a few quid in your purse for impulses. Not scratching around to pay the utility bills each month or worrying that you just spent the sky bill when you did the big supermarket shop. Being able to go on holiday and spend a decent amount guiltlessly while you're away. As different as we all are, most of what I just said will have struck a chord more often than it didn't. Some of us like to travel, some of us don't. Some of us like cars, some of us don't. But we're all wired in a similar way. We want a place to call home, food in our bellies, and financial stability in our day-to-day lives. Now, in an effort to give background to my whole coaching career, I'm going to detour a little here, but bear with me, I'll loop back around. I started getting interested in personal finance when I first saw a show called Your Money or Your Life with Alvin Hall on BBC Two back in the late 90s. I'd studied economics at school, had just taken it into a university degree, 
and had and, and still have a genuine interest in business things. The part of me that likes logic likes business and maths. I like that if you do something, there's a prescribed reaction. If there's a calculation, then there's a right answer at the end of it. Sure, in real life, everything moves constantly, so it's never clean enough to calculate the perfect answer without making lots of assumptions. But when Alvin Hall started to go into people's homes and help them realise how much debt they had, give them a plan on how to stop overspending, and then get out of debt slowly, I was hooked. I bought his books over the years, watched anything else he did on TV, and found his occasional programmes on radio. He proved to me that people can be helped, even if it is one by one. At the same time, I'd long been watching Working Lunch on BBC Two again, with its economics focus, but it was the personal finance stuff that really, really appealed to me. In the mid-noughties, Martin Lewis, the the money-saving expert, started to come to prominence, and he's championed consumers in this country ever since. His site's hugely popular, and his efforts are never-ending. He raised the bar for effort and reach. What he doesn't really do, though, is what Alvin Hall did. He no longer helps people get out of debt by giving them a money makeover. It's time-consuming, it's a difficult job, I understand. But if you get yourself on that boat, then much of what Martin Lewis directly advocates is worth listening to, and indirectly implementing. A few years ago, I was playing with my Android phone and downloaded a podcast from a very popular US radio personality. I discovered the Dave Ramsey radio show. This involves callers ringing in and asking direct advice from the show host, Dave Ramsey, a self-proclaimed financial guru. He asked them what they owe, how do they owe it, credit cards, student loans, and how much their household income is. His advice is then tailored to them all in three minutes of radio time. The show still runs daily, and it's fantastic listening. My only problem is that America and Britain are different. We have different financial worlds. In the US, there's lots of big personal finance personalities. Dave Ramsey borrowed much of his approach from his forerunner, Larry Burkett, an evangelising financial counsellor. For women, there are Susie Orman and David Bach promoting get rich through listening to your feelings or not buying Starbucks every day. For the technical guys, there's the financial planner Rick Edelman and his never-pay-off-your-mortgage philosophy. These are popular figures on TV and radio, seemingly everywhere. And they sell lots of books alongside these shows. Now, you can't copyright common sense. So from Alvin Hall to Dave Ramsey to Martin Lewis, much of money advice is based around the same ideas. Spend less than you earn, don't carry a lot of debt, and save money for the future. And people like steps. Open any magazine in the world and you'll see steps. Three steps to clear a skin. Five steps to start your own business. Ten steps on growing a third arm. We like steps. We like them, I believe, because we feel as though we are progressing. We have a path to follow, and on that we will reach our goal. And they act as reference points. We can see where we are on our journey. I'm on step three of five, just two more steps to go. So taking a step-based approach, combining it with a belief of never comparing yourself to other people, and thinking like a Brit, not a Yank, I put together my seven simple steps to personal finance. It's designed to be a framework that you can work along step by step, as well as a way of referencing against, to see where you are realistically, to judge how healthy you yourself are financially. So let me run you through my seven steps. I'll say them all, and then we'll go back and tackle each of them one by one, giving you an insight into my thinking on each. Here are all seven. Simple step one. Find out where your money goes, and create a spending plan. Simple step two. Put £1,000 into a rainy day fund. Simple step three. Pay off debts in order of smallest first. Simple step four. Top up your rainy day fund to four to six months of living expenses. Simple step, four and a half. Save for a deposit on a house. Simple step five. Invest 15% of household income for your future and that of your children. Simple step six. Pay off your house. Simple step seven. Aim for financial independence. So that's then, my simple steps. 
Let's see where my thinking comes from then. Simple step one, find out where your money goes and create a spending plan. It's very hard to get control of your spending if you're bouncing around like a pinball financially. If your approach is just putting out fires, then it's fair to say that you're being reactive instead of proactive. You know what I mean, hitting the ATM every couple of days for little cash withdrawals, chip and pinning your spending willy-nilly, switching over to the credit card when the debit card runs low, or only ever hitting the credit card and carrying an unpaid balance every month. Bills get paid on a first-come, first-served basis until the money runs out and there's usually more month left to come. That's financial firefighting. So step one is to switch yourself from reactive to proactive. Sit down with a couple of recent bank statements and see where your money actually goes. Then create a plan for next month's money. Where will it deliberately go? Then try and live to it. You'll make a mess of it at first, but after a couple of attempts, you'll tweak the process down. Then you'll be able to spend next month's money on purpose, on paper, before the start of the month. Instead of spending like a leaky hose pipe, you'll be focused, hitting some personal goals like saving a little, covering all your bills, not going into the overdraft or resorting to credit cards. You'll have to work within the boundaries of the plan, but unless your income's really low, it won't be like a constraining budget. Deliberately spend on things you like to do. Try to save money on things you don't like to spend on, but have to. And put a little aside as savings or make payments towards your debt. So that's step one. Find out where your money goes and create a spending plan. Simple step two, put £1,000 into a rainy day fund. Now, once you regain control of your finances, it's then time to get in the game. You've mastered the skills. Now we're going to compete. You could start by paying off any debts and getting yourself on a level playing field. But the only problem with charging headfirst into your debts is that it won't take much to derail you. Say you're paying off £300 a month on your credit card and then just a few months in, your car gets a flat tyre, you've got no spare cash to pay it with. So you have to take the psychological hit of paying for it on the very card you're paying off. Game over, you're now off the wagon. Bye bye financial control, welcome back financial firefighting. So how do we avoid this? We build a buffer, a small cash buffer. Some cash that insulates us from bad luck and keeps our financial juggernaut on course. I've picked an amount that rounds up nicely, a thousand pound. If you earn a modest income, let's say under 18,000 a year, a thousand pounds is still a lot of money. So aim for 500 instead. If you earn good money though, a thousand pounds your target. Go for it on eBay, have a car boot sale, sell anything you haven't used since last Christmas and scratch together the grant. All that debt went somewhere. It's the disused camera, the DVD collection, the mobile phone, the clothes that no longer fit. So get flogging. Once you have the £1,000 rainy day fund, you'll be able to focus on your financial flight path with the security of knowing you can't be sent off course by the little things. Bad luck and unexpected events won't have the power to derail you anymore. You'll be able to absorb them. Flat tyre, new clutch need a plumber or the microwave breaks, you've got it covered. But we're also being pragmatic. A grand isn't enough to ward off major problems. A broken boiler is likely to cost a couple of thousand minimum. Damaged cars very quickly cost more to repair than a kidney itself for. So I want you to feel the pressure of any debt you have. It shouldn't be taken lightly. We give ourselves breathing room in the form of a thousand pound buffer and then we puff our chest out, roll up our sleeves and start swinging away at any debts we have to clear. With your blood pumping, you can focus that rage. Remember that why from the first podcast? There's your passion. There's your fire. Use it. Which leads us to simple step three. Pay off your debts in order of smallest first. Your best tool for building a nice life and building long-term wealth is your income. If a big chunk of your income leaves the account each month, to service credit cards and loans, then your future is being sold to finance the present. Get out of debt and all of that money is yours. No longer do you have to pay 18% for the privilege of borrowing. Imagine if everything you earned was yours. Only the government takes a bite. 
not MasterCard, not Visa, not HSBC, not Santander, not Barclays, not RPS. If living by a deliberate monthly spending plan makes your money appear to go further, well, having all your income to yourself is a reality. You really will feel and be richer. So we take any debts you have, overdrafts, credit cards, loans, higher purchases, and we list them from smallest to largest. We take the smallest one and we put any spare cash we have to paying it off. We squeeze our spending plan to free up as much as possible and we attack the debts in order, making sure to pay at least the minimums on each. Now any maths geniuses out there already are arguing that you pay off in order of interest rates. Start with the most expensive debt and pay that off first. The problem here though is human nature. Say your most expensive debt is a £10,000 credit card on a 0% balance transfer of course and you've got £200 each month to go towards paying that debt. That's going to be four long years till you've paid off £10,000. But if you look to pay off the smallest debt first, you get a reinforcing signal much quicker. You get positive feedback much quicker. Say it was a £500 store card that was your smallest debt. You'd knock that little thing out in just a few months. That little high, that sense of relief that you're actually making inroads. See, that's human behaviour. It's not simply maths. So attacking from smallest to largest means you get to witness your successes much quicker. And once you've paid off the first debt, you can roll that money over to the next debt and add it to the minimum you were paying on the next debt along. Then you'll be paying off that one with increased focus and intensity. And once that's done, roll on to the next one, adding your payment to the monthly minimum, and so on and so on, until all the debts have been paid off. Now we're talking about debts here, stuff like loans and cards. A mortgage, if you have one, although it is a debt, isn't paid off at this step as it's likely to be multiples of your annual income. So we deal with that separately later on. But all that consumer stuff, the stuff you borrowed on that you deep down regret, that's what we're clearing here. Simple step three is likely to be the hardest of all my steps. If you start this process with debts, you have to learn to live on less than you make as well as sacrificing to pay off debts. Now I said these steps were simple. I never said they were easy. But if you keep thinking of your why, you'll have the strength to win at this. So you've reclaimed your income, paid off your debts. It's on to simple step four, top up your rainy day fund to four to six months of living expenses. Now we're out of the woods and it's time to really buffer ourselves against bad luck and misfortune. We want to build that rainy day fund to a substantial amount. That money you were using to pay off debts Put it aside until you have four to six months of living expenses. That should give you protection against some serious bad luck. Now importantly, we're talking about living expenses here, not income. Check your spending plan and see how much it actually costs you to exist for a month. It may be as simple as saying monthly take home pay minus debt payoffs, but your spending plan will show you your living expenses accurately. By building up four to six months of these, we can really, really insulate ourselves. Say you lost your job. Would having six months to find a new one take the pressure off? Thought so. If your boiler blew up, or high winds ripped half your roof off, would having a rainy day fund of several thousand pounds be helpful in paying to fix these? Thought so. If you wanted to change jobs and take a gamble on a new position, would having peace of mind that all your bills would be paid for half a year help? I thought so. You can see where I'm going with this. So simple step four is to top up your rainy day fund to four to six months of living expenses. Now, by the way, if you had to dip into this fund, you just pause the steps and you build that fund back up again. Once it's replenished, you hit play and you carry on with the other steps. It's like a ladder. You can climb up and down. It's not one way. Now, once we hit this place, we may want to look at our housing situation. If you already have a house and a mortgage, we crack straight on to step five. If you don't though, now's the time to start taking that spare cash you've been put into your debts and then your rainy day fund and use it to start saving for a deposit on a place. You'll be used to living on less than you earn, so keep doing so and build up a pot of cash for the mortgage man. 
just think how pleased he'll be when you show him your spending plans in the last six months or so. That affordability test won't put up much of a fight. You've solid evidence that you are responsible with money and live on less than you earn. You know, go ahead, pinch yourself. This isn't a dream. So that's simple step four and a half. Save for a deposit on a house. It's four and a half because some of you will need to, some of you won't. Once that's out of the way, or if you're skipping it because you're already on the property ladder, it's forward to the next simple step. In fact, the next two steps can be attempted simultaneously if you have enough spare cash to do so. Simple step five, invest 15% of household income for your future and that of your children. We all get old, I know, I'm sorry, but we do. And it seems to happen sooner than we think. So let's build up a big pot of money that means we will be able to not work and enjoy our later years. In normal speak, this is retirement, but I don't don't like that word. It's too restrictive. I prefer to think of it as buying your future. You might want to work after your government pensionable age comes around, but do so part-time or voluntarily. By thinking of it as buying your future, we take away a deadline. Saving 15% of your before tax household income is a healthy amount. You'll guarantee a smooth transition from working to not working at the end of your 30 to 40 year working life. You might use pensions and ISAs to save and invest for the long term, sure. The return the investments make may vary each year, sure. But saving 15% is a damn sight better than saving nothing. Many people think saving 5 or 10% is a lot but it wouldn't be anywhere near enough to buy a bright future. 15% of your gross income invested for the future means you're much more likely to not have to take a massive lifestyle cut when you retire. You may even have enough after just 20 years to retire early, take a career break, swap jobs, start your own business. Having that money opens lots of doors. And you could treat your kids, first cars, private school, university costs, help with a deposit, Having money opens doors, but it also opens your heart to generosity. Now, if there's more spare money left over each month in your spending plan, once step five is being done, you can start. Simple step six, pay off your house. Excess money after your lifestyle has been met can be used to pay off your last and only remaining debt, your mortgage. Most mortgages in the UK start out at 25 years. Now, that's a long time. Now, if you had a child, taught them to walk, talk, sent them off to school, saw them have their first girlfriend, watched them grow into a young adult, leave school, start university, leaving home to do so, and even start their career, all of that's still less than 25 years, from baby to adult. Do you really want to keep a mortgage around for that long? No. So once we free up some spare income and still maintain our lifestyle and still put money aside for the future, then we look to pay off the mortgage early. Even a small overpayment on a mortgage can lessen the duration quite significantly. You not only trim this year's amount owed, but the many years behind it that you'd still be paying interest on. So once the house is completely paid for, you can say that all of your income is yours. Not a person or a bank or a company in the world has rights to any of your cash. You pay for things because you want to, not because you have to. Now we could stop there, no debts at all, money for the future building up in investments, a rainy day fund against life's bad luck. That's all she wrote, isn't it? Well, I have one final step, because I want you to live the best life you can. Simple step seven, aim for financial independence. Imagine having saved enough that you never have to work again. You could fill your days doing whatever it is your passion drives you to, And it doesn't take lottery wins to get here either. It's not easy, but it's not impossible. Say your combined household income is £80,000. After tax, you'd have about £4,500 each month. If you were saving 15% of your gross income, another grand a month, had no mortgage, saving you another, let's say, £1,000 a month, and were living a good but modest lifestyle, you might only need £2,000 of this salary each month to cover your bills. Do some calculations, go on, I'm not far wrong. So if you only needed £2,000 a month to live, you'd need 24 grand a year. If you had a pot of cash of, say, 600000 which, from your 15% of income invested over the years, might be doable, 
then you could draw an annual £24,000 income from this very large pot each year and get back enough returns to top up the pot every year. This is known as the 4% rule if you want to go research it, but my argument here is not about the maths. It's that living independently wealthy is merely a trade-off between your spending habits and your investments. It doesn't require a euro millions win to live a life without work. Be intentional, save diligently over the years, live within your means, and it's definitely achievable. For that reason, I think the final step should be one that lets you reach for the clouds. Simple step seven, aim for financial independence. So that's them, my simple steps. If you want more on each of the steps, feel free to head over to the website and read blog articles on each of them sspf.co.uk slash blog peruse away the first eight posts are about each of these steps in turn now the hard part of any change is the personal behavior change we all understand the logic we appreciate the sentiment to doing the right thing but living a life seeing through the day-to-day distractions that's where the reward is won and lost if you set your behavior to a plan then the fog of life won't keep you from your long-term goals never have a plan and you'll successfully achieve nothing every time. So try my steps. They're broad enough that you can mould yourself to fit them. They're defined enough that you can judge your progress against them. They won't tell you what house to buy, what car to drive, what holiday to go on, how to keep up with the Joneses. But they will give you the tools you need to live a lifestyle you can afford. Own a house that is a home and not a burden. Pay for holidays now, not be due a first payment when the plane lands back in Blighty. And perhaps the most important lesson of all, they provide a satisfaction that you know you are doing the best you can for yourself and your family. You might not drive a brand new BMW like your neighbour, but you'll sleep easy knowing that you don't owe anybody. Your family's looked after, and you're protected from hard times. Now, for me, they're the real bragging rights. Next time we're going to talk about how to set up your everyday financial life to make this good behaviour easier and make living simpler, more automatic and less difficult so you can put your energy into the real fights, not the avoidable ones. For more information, check out sspf.co.uk Thanks for listening to the Simple Steps Personal Finance Podcast. This podcast is copyright of Simple Steps Personal Finance Limited and can be shared freely. Tell your friends about Simple Steps Personal Finance. A big thanks to Partners in Rhyme for the music used in this podcast. See you next time.